It's all yours. Sure. Okay. Very good. Uh, thank you, Gerald. And also, um, thank you for the invitation to, to come here and speak. Um, I, I think I, I have something here to share with you, and it, it, it's quite frankly an honor to be here in front of all of you. Understand this. This is for you. So use the time. Ask me the questions. I go through this and, and really understand, okay? So again, a nice introduction. Thank you, Gerald. I'm Mark Bold. I'm with a, a farm advisor with UC Cooperative Extension. Familiar with Cooperative Extension? Show of hands. Okay, great. Cooper UC Cooperative Extension, I just said this to the smaller group before. Very briefly, 1863, depths of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln founded what are known as the Land Grant Institution, of which the University of California is one. There's a number in the Midwest, you know, University of Illinois, University of Iowa. And the, one of the purposes of these universities was to teach farmers, people that fish, miners, people of nascent technologies on how to progress and how to move America forward. And part and parcel of that, obviously you had your universities which were doing the, these investigations in agricultural technology and other sorts of technology, but to teach people where they live and teach people where they work. So. Cooperative Extension, for example, in my case, my office is in Watsonville up in Santa Cruz County. So we're right there. So as problems come up, we know about them and we can investigate them. One of the unique things about UC Cooperative Extension in California is that the farm advisors do research. We're only one person, but we have the entire University of California behind us to form teams and take on just about everything. If you can believe it, Gerald, we worked with an expert on Mixococcus which is a microbe in the soil, very beneficial. The guy has samples back to 1899. University of California, working together with UC Cooperative Extension, we can address these things, okay? So what I'm gonna do this morning, uh, I wanna talk to you about the cost of production study for conventional strawberries. And like Gerald said, these costs, of, I'm gonna ask again, anybody familiar with cost of production studies? Okay, well you will be. California is very unique. We got like 60 or 70 different crops that we grow. All right. And for someone endeavoring to take these on, the cost of production study is very useful. One, because it's a summary of how to grow the crop, but more importantly, it's the economics of the crop. We've had, we've had a number of discussions about this already to get today with Gerald and then Shashika was there as well. You know, it's great to grow a crop well, but if you're going to run that as a business, and year after year, you lose money at doing that, you're not going to be in business for very long. And Gerald, you expressed some surprise. At, well, not surprise, but um, astonishment, is that a fair word? When Michael came here and he was just talking about business. He had spreadsheets. He had all this stuff. Because it's a business at the end of the day. You have to be a good grower, but you also need to be a good business person. And what these studies do, of which you have one, the, the most recent update of the conventional strawberries, is tell you how much it's going to cost, but not only that, how much your expected return can be in a number of different scenarios, okay? And again, this time is for you and not for me, so please ask questions. That's what I'm here for. I've, I've built it so there's sufficient time. So I'm going to start with the assumptions of the study. And then we'll get into the production, cultural practices, and inputs. This is the summary of the study. Julie, I'm not walking around much. See that? I thought I was going to be all over the place. But now I'm, I'm, I'm wired down here, so I can't move. <laughs> so you're safe there in the back. Don't worry, I'm not coming. <laughs> so how profitable are berries? So that's going to be now the second part is, OK, given all these costs, what can I expect as far as profits? And that is what we, is called a ranging analysis. And that's going to be one of the last things that we look at from the study. But then we're going to go ahead and look at other cropping systems in comparison to strawberries because there's, there's some threads in strawberries I really want to get across to all of you this afternoon. And then lastly, if we have time, and I think we will, is going to be apply what we learned in various uh, scenarios. And actually, matter of fact, I'm going to use Michael uh, Clue's uh, spreadsheets and compare them to ours. Not to say who's right or who's wrong, but how you can use this study to apply to a real world situation. We, we good? Everybody there? Okay, page three, starting with the assumptions. The farm that we're using here is a 30-acre farm, 27 acres of which are used for farming. What about the other three acres? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Barley. 
What's that? Yes, yes. On farm buildings, and then also let's not forget the roads. Because in strawberries, you got trucks going in and out to collect the harvested produce all the time. So some of that acreage is going to be used for roads. You have to do that. Your irrigation only goes 250, 300 feet tops. So you're going to need roads to access that. That's different than lettuce where you have these giant stretches of, of field. So 27 acres are used for farming. Three acres is, it's not non-productive land because you're using it for a different purpose, but you're not planting it. The rent, and so each one of these slides will have a cost. So the rent that we use is $2,700 an acre. How did I get that number? I'm not sitting in a room generating these numbers on my own or going on the internet, you know, using Google. No, we go and meet with growers. I know a lot of different growers and, you know, when they have some time and it can be at the drop of ad, it's like, hey, Mark, I got a half an hour. You want to come over? Okay, yeah, I'm coming. And so we start going through, what's your land rent? You know, how much you pay for irrigation? How about fertilizer? All this stuff, I write it all down. And so these studies represent an average. And that's going to be something I emphasize here shortly because there's an average, because a lot of growers are going to say, well, I'm paying more or I'm paying less. I know this is an average to give you a general idea of how much it costs to grow strawberries. So the rent that we have is $2,700 per acre. I know Michael was at 3,000. So there you have it, that's different. Production practices and inputs, I believe we are still on page uh, three. That's gonna be the uh, land preparation portion. This is right here, this is a subsoiler and the use of this is $164 per acre. Now, I need to take on something a, a little complicated here, but you need to understand this. So, the subsoil, you, you have a person on the tractor driving it back and forth over the field, and it's costing you money. It's a person on the tractor. Well, how about the tractor and how about the subsoiler? I mean, if we're using a crawler, the crawler is like $350,000. Well, if you cost the crawler in a single year, you're not making any money. You're like negative cash flow in a huge way. Same thing with the subsoiler. If you go to back, uh, the, tables, tab the, the tables on the last page is 18 and 19. We'll, we'll show you how we're doing this. It's called depreciation. The subsoiler is $10,600. $10, Again, you are not costing that in a single year. You're spreading it out over time. That's called depreciation. The subsoiler we have over 10 years, that's a usable life, and then you have your salvage, your salvage value, and the tractor is over 15. What you're doing is dividing the cost of that over a period of time. If you do, if you do taxes, that are a little more complicated. Anybody here follow stocks? You ever look at the 10Ks? When you're looking at manufacturing, they're depreciating, so you're not taking these huge baths from time to time. It's really difficult to understand what is going on if I'm costing machinery that's worth half a million dollars in a single year. So that's why we depreciate. Any, any questions on that? And we are depreciating by hour and by acre for this study. Okay, so you, you get it as a general concept? Okay, because it's, it's an important one. Okay, so let's look at, so the subsoil is used twice. And then we have our disc and chisel. The chisel's been used six times. And then the chisel is being used twice, I believe. So the subsoil, we broke it down nice and deep so we get good drainage. And then the disc is breaking up the clods and the chisel is doing much of the same. 10 total trips across the field. Some growers do 18 trips across the field. I'm from Illinois. We have something called no-till. I came here, I went crazy. I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. You're going across the field so many times. But again, strawberries, it's a horticulture crop. It's not corn or beans. You need to maximize the ability of the plant to grow well, okay? So passes and tillage across the field are a lot. They don't cost much. Right, we're looking at $100, $100 here and $100 there. Okay, now we're starting to look at some costs. This is a conventional strawberry study, so we're gonna talk about fumigation. Soil fumigation costs $5,000 an acre. Growers used to do soil fumigation on their own. There's nobody doing it as far as I know anymore. It's a highly regulated activity. I'm not sure if it's done right, that it's dangerous, but nevertheless, it is a regulated activity, and therefore there's uh, two or three companies that do it, TriCal, uh, soil fume, who's that? that's a yellow tractor soil fume, and then I think CPS, and there might be one other one that's doing it. In our study, it's 350 pounds of chlorpicrin per acre. The plastic uh, goes out behind the tractor and it remains there for two weeks. Just a note to you, when we had methyl bromide, the plastic stayed on for six days. You could turn over the field one week faster when you're paying $2,700 an acre. Time matters. 
But the regulations say now that we need to leave it on for two weeks, so it is. And then the tarp is removed. Usually the grower will take the tarp off, cut the tarp. They got a little, they pull it behind a little gator and they split the plastic open, let it breathe out, and then a day or two later they collect the plastic and they take it to the dump. Okay? Any, any, any questions on that? So this is now a significant cost in production, $5,000 per acre. However, as our plant pathologists know, um, it is a necessary step for conventional berries because we have some mean pathogens out there. All right, so we continue with that. So overhead irrigation, this is now, I put this after the fumigation, but before the fumigation, you have to sprinkle as well to moisten the soil because the fumigant is a gas. If the soil is dry, it will not distribute well through the soil. Then once you're done with the fumigation, you sprinkle again to moisten the soil so you can do your bed listing and your bed shaping. That's $317 per acre. The, the, you know, the sprinkler pipe is, it's, there's some money there. The water is not that expensive, but there's people involved. Has anybody here ever moved sprinkler pipe? What do you think? Thoughts? <laughs> it's hard work. <laughs> I hate it. It's bad for your back. Did you do two or one at a time? Two. I like you. <laughs> Very good. So you know and you can appreciate, that's why this cost is a little higher because now we have people moving it and then hooking it up. Okay, so bed and field preparation, grading of the roads, $27 per acre. List and shaping of the beds, $27. It's just one pass. Sometimes people list and then shape separately. Listing is simply throwing up the soil kind of in a pile and then going down. And then the shaping, you have a bed shaper. I don't have a picture of one, I'm sorry. The bed shaper now presses that down. You want to have a good angle on the side and then canting at the top so water does not gather. Shaping beds is a, I would say that's a very skilled activity. Okay, show of hands, who here has shaped beds before? Okay, wow. I tell you, Cal Poly is great. If I do this at UC Davis, no one's going to raise their hand. What, uh, so, what, what thoughts on shaping beds? You have to time it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't slow down. Uh huh. Right? Sand is great. You know, I was once out in Florida. I was doing some subcontracting work. I used to work for a private contractor. Razor sharp. It was all sand. It was great. But then you go into clay over here. It's like, oh. <laughs> so again, that's a listing and the shaping of the bed. That, that's wonderful. You guys have done that. That's a, that's a really nice skill to have, really. Uh, install drip irrigation system. Now, so now we're at $1,600 for the uh, drip irrigation system. Wow, that's a big number. Remember though, we are buying the drip tape and it's only gonna be used once, so it's just expensed in one year. We also using, not, not people to put the tape out, that's done with a tractor, but all of the stuff, the lines and so forth on the side are being put in with people, hook it up, you know, make sure everything's nice, so that's $1,600. Placement of pre-plant fertilizer, that's an 18, what I got, 18.6, oh, 18.8, 13, $438. Remember, there's a 2021 study, 2022, Got some hostilities in Ukraine. The price of fertilizer has gone up. It's almost double now. So this is something that you're gonna be looking at. It's mostly the cost of fertilizer, the actual putting it out. You are putting it out with a tractor that comes out in a bead. I'm gonna set it in a little bit so the roots of the strawberries don't get on that. And then the laying of the plastic on top, I, di I divided that out. So we have $241 for the labor of the plastic laying and then 452 for the plastic itself. It's only used once, the plastic, and then it's thrown away. Again, this is done with a tractor, but there's a lot of human labor. I'm, I'm assuming some people have done plastic then. Yeah, you gotta have people at the ends of the rows, get it on the edge, just tightening and that kind of thing. So there's again human labor and that's $241 per acre. Moving on now, now we're at transplanting. Many growers, I'm not using the pointer, is that okay? Can you follow, okay? Sometimes I have more pictures, okay. So uh, the, on the left hand side, you have the, um, the hole punch. But it's not just merely punching holes in the plastic, it's also pushing the soil down to make a little, uh, a, a little hole for the plant to be put in. Okay, and then after that, hopefully on the same day so that doesn't dry out, now we have the actual planting. The actual planting, which is including a 5% replant, 5% is normal, this, this happens, uh, is $4,503. The plants are about 3,000 and then it's human labor that's putting the plants in. It's human labor. Now, all of the things that I have told you so far, 
the ground preparation, the sprinkling, the fumigation, the bed formation, and now the planting. That is 60% of success in strawberries. If you mess up on any of those steps, you're going to suffer for the rest of the season. And this is the most critical day of a grower season right here. Because these plants, say you plant them a little high, the plant will dry out. You go too deep, the plant may get sick. How about if you J-root it? Any opinions on what happens if you push it in with your hand and then leave the ends pointing up? Any thoughts? Is it good or bad? Bad. Why? The roots need to grow down. Now the plant has to fight to grow back down again. It's going to establish slower. Here's the deal. And I think I've said this line two or three times now today. I really like this line. This is uh, Michael Clue, one of his growers, Rebecca Bozarth, was up. Sorry, Joe, you got to hear this again. <laughs> but it's a good line. Michael Clue, one of the growers that he worked with, uh, on, the, uh, on the Central Coast for, for what this study done. Rebecca Bozarth, I invited her to one of my big meetings, Grower Highlight. I had her talk about all her growing stuff. And she got up there and she said this. She said, if you're a strawberry grower and you're not a people person, you got a problem. You as a strawberry grower, and this is one of the themes that I'm getting into, you are managing people. And if you don't like working with people, you got a problem. You've got one and a half people per acre in strawberries. And on planting day, say for example, you're not a good manager and the people don't like you, you're not gonna get your plants done well. If your supervisor's out there watching the planting take place, it's kind of like, ah, I'll let it go. You're gonna have a planting problem. It really comes down, we all know, if any one of us is planting three or four strawberry plants in your garden, they'll be perfect, right? You got all the time in the world. We're planting tens of thousands of plants in a day with hundreds of people. You're going to need very good supervision to make sure that job is done right. And it needs to be done quickly. So you have to incentivize your grower, your, your planters well. All right? So planting day is very important. And there, yes, there is a cost associated with it. And then the last step is roll the plants to pack them down. We want to set that, you know, get them, close the pore spaces around the plant. But we're also going to run the overhead irrigation to close that up even more. I will just say a note here, the UCIPM recommendations for strawberries say that the plants go in before the plastic. No one really does that anymore. Have you seen that, Gerald? Burning holes? No, that people are putting the plastic on after they plant. I have. It's rare. It used to be done so much more. It's much better for the plant because the plant, the soil can actually breathe. But the way people are working now, it just can't be done. Just know that it takes a little, it's a little harder because you can't see and then you got to find the holes and everything like that. It's not done that frequently anymore. So that's why we have this hole puncher and everything like that in there. Okay. And any, any comments, questions? We're doing good? Okay. I, I, are you following okay? I want to make sure that I'm, you know, I have these little tangents about the, you know, what's important, but really. Okay. Runner removal and weeding. So now the, the plants are growing. The runner removal is there on, on the right hand side, on your left hand, sorry. Uh, 2,683. Okay, here we go. This is an interesting point. One of the things as we were preparing to do this study, we got some calls from some people very interested in, in um, there's a robot that they're trying to get to use for cutting runners. Obviously, if runner cutting is a very expensive activity, it makes the robot more attractive to use. So, you know, I got some contacts from some very big names in the industry. Mark, your number's way too low. It was, it was lower than this, actually. It was like $1,200 or something for the runner cutting. You got to raise that number. Okay, well, let me go and do my interviews. I'm not going to have people place their personal costs on here. This isn't, this is an average, right? So I went out to growers, the University of California growers, matter of fact, they are very high. $5,000, $4,000 for running an acre. That is a big cost. That is on the level with our fumigation. But guess what? Driscoll's varieties don't run her very much. Their running costs are $150 to $250. Driscoll's plants are 50% of the industry, and voila, $2,600 for runnering. No one has that cost, but I have to include the industry as a whole. So when you're looking at your expenses and so forth, you're going to have to look close at that one. I have to represent the industry impartially. Yes? Uh, I know many of you probably know this, but could you explain what is Oh, what's that? Yeah, the run. Yeah, I, you know, when I practice this, I did say, now I got all wound up here in front of the audience. <laughs> no, just kidding. 
So the, the deal with runnering is, so the runnering, as you know, it's a stolen of the plant and it produces the daughter plants. And when you're in the nursery level, that's great because you want to produce daughter plants. But when you're in the production field, obviously the plant is committing resources and energy to growing runners and you do get lower yields and the fruit runs to be smaller. So you do need to remove those. You really have to. It, it'll be noticeable if you don't do it. So it's very smart to remove those runners. I think people are removing them once a month. I think that's what we have. But it does go through the season. Hence the importance of, of cutting the runners. Thank you, Gerald. I appreciate that. Did you have a question there? Yeah, that was my question regarding the season. Like, when did it start and when did it stop? And then also, is that per acre? That's, everything's per acre, yes. And it does go through the season. Thank you. Thank you. And that's the same with the, the weeding. It's, I think we have it at once a month. Weeding is a little lower, but it's still some money. And that is because you are using people. Everything in strawberries, a lot of the things in strawberries are using people. Okay, so weeding, that's an organic field. You would not see that generally. Most of the weeding is taking place around the, the crown of the plant in that little hole. Okay. Okay, so here's another one where people are like, are you kidding me? This isn't right. This isn't my program. Fertility is something that really is hard to get out of a grower. Everybody has their own system for it. And as you know, a lot of people are doing very well with it. So I just have a very generic fertility program here. I'm really basing it on the amount of nitrogen that goes in, which is usually between 200 and 250 pounds of nitrogen. Nitrogen is a driver in strawberry. Phosphorus, potassium, you have that in spades in the soil. Nevertheless, people do get results out of it. I'm not going to be one to say that you're wrong. I'm not a grower. But I do use the, the nitrogen numbers. So we have the generic mix of CN9, CAN17, uh, CANO3, mono potassium phosphate, 63030. And that's all drip applied through the course of the season. Very easy to do. You're just, it's just the cost of your fertilizer right there. That's it. The, the human labor component of that is minimum. Okay, so that's your post plant fertility. We do have the uh, cost of the pest control advisor. We have that at $125. Many growers are, are pretty good at doing uh, pest identification, but the actual, um, how, how should I say, actionability of that information is now another matter, right? So if you have aphids and it's kind of cool, should you spray, should you not? That's where it's going to be where you're going to get a PCA. Most growers do use a PCA, if not just to get the chemicals from the <coughs> distributor, right? And again, also there's paperwork that's involved with submitting a notice of intent. So that's all the grower washes his or her hands of it and it's done. There's a range, I know Michael, he was at $50, is $125. You can make a pretty good living doing PCA work. It's intense. Remember, you, in your care, you have a very expensive crop. But again, it's, there's a lot of things going on with, with that sort of work and it's certainly important. And I, I shared this with the group before. In our central coast area, I think we probably have about 15 PCAs in total. So here's the sprays. Uh, the sprays is very generic. I, what I do want you to see, if you look at the column there for mildew, we're spraying every month for mildew. Uh, Botrytis is in the beginning of the season. And then uh, anthracnose, not all the time, but when we do have it, you definitely do need to spray for it. And then um, mites, putting on the savvy, that's an oversight. For similis, I'll get to shortly. And then you can see as we continue down the season, growers uh, do uh, apply Elevate Captan and then into June, Elevate. I don't necessarily agree with these late season uh, botrytis sprays, but be that as it may, they are being applied 100% through the industry, and so I included in my study. So, and you can see that the miticides are going in, and also ligus starts to kick in in May, and then worms, uh, for many years now, we've had the light brown apple moth, and there's other ones, cut worms and things like that. So you do have some rather inexpensive applications taking place for worms, okay? Again, a very generic pest management scenario. This is persimilis, very ubiquitous use of predatory mites. It used to be 20,000, 40,000 mites per acre. If you look at the older studies, now we're up to 80,000. Organic growers use even more. And uh, that's $600. Some of that is the hand application, but I think most of the price there is because of the, uh, the cost of the mites themselves. Okay? Wow. Yes, uh, Shashika. No herbicides. No. Some, sometimes people are using them if they have a weaker fumigant. For example, if they're using a drip fumigant, they'll use, uh, you know, in the er very early part of the season, like right after planting or something like that, but no in season, no. Thank you. Yeah? What's the reason why you don't agree with the late season application of the 
Botrytis, it, it, because we, we just had a giant discussion in the field about this too, I don't think they actually work because you don't have much botrytis. Botrytis, I'm almost thinking, this is speculation, hello camera, I know I'm on camera and everything. <laughs> this is, I think, it used to be there was more botrytis. Now for me, my focus is more on the mucor and the rhizopus rots, the leak rots that you have. Early season, botrytis, yes. It does show up, especially before rain, but once you start the season, it's very hard for us as scientists actually to get treatment separation between where we did not treat and where we did treat. So that's, that's where I stand up. Nevertheless, I do include in the study because it's being used by the growers. Thank you, good question. Yeah? Correct. Each bottle has 2,000 mites in it. And they're done usually in four, in, in four phases. So it's not just all 80,000 at a time. Yeah. The timing of that is critical, by the way. If you get too late on the mite curve, you're, you're going to be too far behind to out-reproduce the persimilis. Yeah? Have you heard of any growers moving more towards the aerial application of red chlorine mites? Or is it still hand? Ooh, yeah. OK, so <laughs> see, you always dip into these areas that are um, they're worth a, a conversation. Haven't seen it up on the central coast, and then there's some questions, even as, as far as industry entomologists, are those mites dropping down to the soil alive? Because they're very, very small, and they're, they're, you're, they're dropping through a column, and they might actually dry out. Are they actually hitting the plant? I've been asked to do studies. It would be very worthwhile, because it goes really fast, right, with a drone, to check it. I don't have the time. I just don't have the time. So it would be interesting. I, do, you, do you do it? No, I was just curious. Okay. I've seen it happen in the field before. And I'm just curious right. Yeah, I, I can't say yay or nay to it. If you, if you use it and you get results, stick with it. I, I can't say yay or nay. It would be interesting to test. It would be actually pretty easy to test, right? You just ask the drone operator to do a big block, not treat a block. You don't even have to go that long, maybe a month, month and a half, and see what's happening to your mites. It's very easy. So, and then um, we have the bug backs right here. This is uh, $1,100 per acre. April through September, it's kind of expensive. Any, any ideas why that might be a little expensive? Fuel price. Diesel. Oh, hey, yeah, you're, this is great. I'm going to bring that up later, too. Fuel, there's a person driving, and it's very frequent. But you also have the cost of the bug back, which I think is between thirty-five and 40000 My ballpark, Darren? Yeah. 40? 60? Okay, okay. So you, you have that, and then you're also you're committing a tractor to it. So you do need the extra tractor. So all that's costed in. Here's the thing. This is a cost of production study. It's an average of the growers. 50% of the growers on the Central Coast use it. 50% don't. In our studies, we haven't seen them do all that well against chemicals, so we left it out. Okay? So the bug vac's not in ours. There's, again, one more. People are, we have to be careful, because the first time I did... A cost of production study. Yeah, again, like, you know, with this runner cutting issue, we had people like, hey, you know, you should put it in. For example, they wanted to use trap crops for ligus in, in strawberries. Well, you should put it in to encourage people to use them. But it's not really being used. So it's not a, it's not a, a, a good representation. So I, I get caught in these things. Is it a good representation? Is it not? Fortunately, I know a lot of growers. I make a lot of phone calls. So I have a good view of what's happening. But be that as it may, bug backs uh, are, are, you know, they're used by a lot of people. So just so you know, it's about $1,100. Okay? per year. Okay, so now, here it comes. So all your grow costs have been incorporated, you've been maintaining the crop, you've been fertilizing, you've been doing your insecticide, your fungicide applications. Now we gotta pick the fruit. $53,000 an acre. Okay, you gotta tell me now, why is this so expensive? What's that? Labor. labor. That's right. A big part of this is labor. The other part of that pick the fruit cost is the cardboard box and the clamshells. I think they're between two fifty and three dollars, but everything else is labor. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, little pun here. I'm gonna belabor that point in just a moment. <laughs> okay, all right. I, I thought it worked just <laughs> I've done, I've done better. Okay, so load, loading and hauling. You can see the the truck in the picture. So that all the all the boxes get taken up to the the truck and then loaded on. And once that truck is full, then it goes down to the cooler. The cooler is, is cooling the fruit. It's $1,300 to cool. What's interesting, uh, cooling for some companies, some companies are including, they, they have a research arm, for example, and so the cooling cost is including the research arm. So we have to tease some of that out. 
of the cooling. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. 4500 for the cooling. I was still looking at loading and hauling. Are, are we clear? I made a mistake. $4,500 for the cooling. Marketing and sales. Just because you have a better mousetrap doesn't mean the world will beat a path to your door. You have to have people on the phone making sales and making markets. This, again, is a highly variable number. But it does need to be included because without marketing, you're going to have a hard time selling fruit. And actually, that's happened. People have called me, hey, Mark, you know, I got a truckload of zucchinis. I want to sell them. What? I mean, how are you going to sell them like in two days? No, you need to make the market and then ship into it. And remember, even a small farm of strawberries produces a tremendous amount of fruit. So marketing sales is important. And then the Strawberry Commission assessment. Strawberry Commission is funding a lot of the, the department here, so that's $203. Is it four and a half cents a box, Gerald? Or Gerald? For the cardboard boxes? No, no, the oh, assessment. Four and a half cents. Four and a half cents per box. So that uh, comes out to $203. And so we have 66259 for fruit picking. Just looking at the, oh, wait, did I miss? No. What did that? Oh, OK. So just looking at the percentage of the fruit harvested, the bulk of the fruit is harvested on the Central Coast June, July, and August. A little bit in April, some in May, and then September is 12%, uh, and October is a very small percentage. Again, substantial discussion this morning. No USA producer is producing its scale in October. And there's a lot of people that want to get into that because the prices are quite good in October. Nobody's in there. Santa Maria's not in there. We're in there at 2%, and ben, uh, Ventura's not. Mexico hasn't started. Mexico starts in November. So that's a good one. Okay, season cleanup. Okay, who's done season cleanup? Worst job in strawberries. This is awful. It's hot. Look at this. Look at this picture. See how the plastic's tearing? So stuff is left behind, right? And then you got, you got to shovel stuff out. It's dusty. Very hot. So $500 for that, for season cleanup. And you roll it up, and then that goes out to the dump. I will tell you, just a little pitch, we're doing some work on biodegradable plastics, myself and some colleagues from the Pacific Northwest. The idea would be, we're getting closer. The plastic's lasting through the season. We're getting that. But the idea would be that you could disc all that in, and it would just disappear. Still work in progress, but that would be great. Because the fact of the matter is, even though you're doing season cleanup, there's little pieces of plastic in here, right? When you guys are visiting fields, you see plastic, right? That plastic will be there. It'll get smaller, but it'll be there forever. So I think we can do better. But that's, that's what we have right now. That's what we have right now. OK, so taking all of this, all of these numbers that you've been looking at, all this equipment, again, there's places that I didn't cover, right? But just putting this together. The cultural labor, our grow costs are $6,777. Cultural input, $14,908. You can, this will be at the bottom of table one. And then harvest labor, $35,705. Harvest input, $30,000. So our total cost of production for strawberries, this is all the money that you're committing, is $87,994. That's a lot of money. Let me show you something. So this is on page 17. If you could turn to that page, please. I, I, wanna, this is, I, want, I want you to see this. This is good. So it's a table at the bottom. If you look at net return per acre above total costs, OK? And we have the table in two ways. These are the yields at the top. And we have a range of yields from 6,000 to 12,000 crates per acre at the top. Everybody at that table there at the bottom. And then we have a range of prices from $7 to uh, $14 per box. All right. I know Michael was showing his, his base cost was 7,500 crates. We don't have that one. So let's go and use the 8,000 as our model. And so if you look, even an $11 market at 8,000 boxes per acre, you're losing uh, 200 and one dollars per acre. You go a little higher when we get in a twelve dollar market. Now you're making uh, seven thousand seven hundred ninety nine dollars. Okay. Now someone's going to say, "Well, the prices of strawberry are variable. You have to look at your average cost, and you have to look at when you're producing the fruit." So, say you're getting a really good market in October, but you're not harvesting that much fruit. Well, that's not going to move the needle very much. It's going to be in the summer. 
So there's two ways that you're going to be able to make a profit here is either growing more berries, but this is, this is the range, right? You're really not going to get above 12,000. And, you know, you don't, you, you do have your sales and your marketing, but the overall market, you cannot control that. That is aggregate demand of the United States and your export markets. You can tweak it with your marketing, but not that much. All right? So growers are in control of this line, but not the one, not the vertical one. Growers are at the mercy of the market. Now, when people ask, and Joe, you brought up this point before, how much does a strawberry grower make? They're asking, is it like a salary? Do you get a monthly check? No. They take home or they lose money at the end of the year. I always like to put it this way. If you want to see how much a strawberry grower makes, you have to look at it over a 10-year scale. There's going to be times that they lose a lot of money. I mean, have a look at some of these numbers. I mean, if you're doing, say you're, you're a great grower, you're 10,000, you're doing 10,000 crates an acre, right? But the market's not giving you anything, and it's $7. You're going to lose $33,000 an acre. What do you think that looks like when you're at 100 acres at that sort of loss? That, man, that's going to be a tough, tough year. And you know what? We've had this when we've had food safety scares. I remember there was an uh, incident to cyclospora. Do you remember this one, Gerald? The raspberries that were shipped in from Guatemala, big confusion. People thought they were strawberries. The market tanked. They were at 3 or $4 a box for about two months. It took a while to recover. That, that's just really, I mean, that just takes your breath away. It's devastating, okay? So you, have, you can have it, well, you know, if you could take a loss like that, it's just going to be kind of hard. But there's going to be years where you lose a lot of money, but then there's going to be years where you make a lot, right? And then there's going to be years where you lose a little bit, and then there's going to be years where you make something. That's how you have to look at it. That's going to be the average that a strawberry grower takes home. It's not a steady income. And I tell you something, I have all the respect in the world for people to take this on. You're working all the time, and you're exposed to this kind of risk, man. I mean, really, so you can feed people. So people have strawberries to put on their ice cream in the morning. You know? This is great. This is truly great. Do you understand this table? And any questions on this ranging analysis? I, I really, this is the reason I work on these studies. Where's the profit point for this crop? And this, actually, I took this out. I just mentioned this to, to Gerald a few minutes ago. Is, um, I took this out to growers, you know, we do the interviews with growers, we put together a study, then we take it out for, you know, to, to vet it, to truth test it, right? And they're like, yeah, you're, you're there, you're there. So there's, there's a lot of risk in there. I mean, forget about this, right? People like 50,000, that, that's not, that doesn't happen, all right? But it's there because it happens to be in the corner, okay? I would say growers are usually around the middle. That's why we have growers around. Yeah, yeah Shashika. We, you know what, we don't, and it's, it's on, the, on the first page, and it's a very good question, thank you. We don't assume varieties. This is, this is blind to varieties. It's only response to the yield and the price that you get. Okay? Yeah, so you could be Driscoll's, well picked, or, or UC. And these would be the prices, given more or less the cost that we have. Okay? So let me show you something. This is, this is I want to emphasize this theme. My theme is that a strawberry grower is exposed to labor. Human labor composes 48% of the cost of production of strawberries. So when, well I'll get into this a little bit later, but I'll mention it right now. So when the minimum wage cost goes up, that moves up the higher, most strawberry pickers don't make minimum, they're, they're, they're above that. But when the minimum goes up, then the other costs get pushed up a little bit too. So when you have rises in your cost of labor, a very small change in the cost of labor can mean a lot. But say there's a change in the price of fertilizer, right? It goes up a little bit. Maybe not double like what we have right now, but say it goes up 10%. But it's such a tiny part of the cost. Let's look at pesticides, for example. I noticed with Michael's, and I'll bring that up again, Michael's pesticide costs are, are substantially higher. Because the cost of losing any part of yield is higher than the use of those pesticides. A lot of pesticides are like $70, $100, bucks, $100 per, right? But you, that doesn't really matter in the scheme of this. This is $87,000. So why would you skimp on a $200 pesticide and put this thing at risk? Your costs are labor. 
Are you make it more efficient? I'm not advocating to pay less. I mean, that's, you know, it's hard enough to keep pickers and, and they need to be respected. And I believe they are paid quite well for what they do. But still, this, when there's changes, especially as inflation kicks in and wages are going up, you hear about you know, unionization, you hear about strikes. This is, this is, this is hairy. This is hairy, okay? And then we have the other, um, the, uh, what we got, the input for the cultural and then the input for the harvest, input for the harvest is the boxes and the clamshells, and then our marketing and our, our cooling, obviously, okay? But let's look at another one. I mean, so if you're considering growing crops, any rice growers here? Sometimes there's rice growers, no? Okay, so rice growing, so look at the cultural input. It's three quarters of the cost of this thing. You look at, you look at the labor. Labor's not, what, maybe 15%? What do you got, maybe a guy on a tractor? I think they fly the seeds on, so he's probably doing an acre like, what, 10 seconds? So it's not, you know, it's totally different. So rice growers are much less exposed to cost of labor. On the other hand, what they're making per acre is $1,400. It's not very much. And again, when you go to the ranging analysis, you know, what they can make per acre might be $100. It's not that much. So they need a lot of acres. They need a lot of land. But they're less concerned about the cost of labor. All right? Strawberries has got to be one of the most labor-intensive crops that we have around. Really. If you want to be a strawberry grower, you have to know how to work with people. Okay, so let's look at some real world examples. How am I doing, Gerald? Am I doing okay? Five minutes. Five minutes? I can go 10 minutes? Okay. So I just wanted to go over uh, Michael's. I did, this is funny. We, we had a meeting yesterday. There's Michael Clue. <laughs> so I'm like, hey, Michael, can I talk to you real quick? <laughs> He's like, he got a kick out of it. It was cool. It, it was really nice. I like talking to Michael. So this is his spreadsheet. And again, this is not to compare one is better than the other. It's just to, okay, what can you do with this cost of production study, right? So you look at a real world example like Michael, and so you see uh, Michael's total grow cost is 33,000. Our total grow cost in the cost of production study is 21,000. Wow, how did that happen? Okay, so I, I just pulled out some highlights. For example, plants, uh, 3450, and then the labor to plant. Oops, the labor to plant is 1,000. That's exactly what we paid. About 3,000, a little bit more than 3,000 for the plants and 1,000 to put them in the ground. Uh, some of these are going up. We had a laugh about the, who's it, who's it? Fuel. We had a good laugh about that. Diesel and fuel costs, and he puts in parentheses variable. Boy, you can say that again. <laughs> I mean, that's, it's changed a lot. It's probably double. These are 2021 numbers that he shared with us. And then, um, so, but again, you know, okay, so it doubles the fuel cost. So it's 800 now, went to 1,600. So that, that's, a, that's a hit. But it's not like the major part of this, of this operation. But it does feed into other things. As gas goes up, your workers are driving to the field. They're going to they're gonna feel the pinch. And so it starts to push the labor costs up. Uh, he has some costs in here that we did not get. Ranch supplies and maintenance. That's good. He's sharp. He keeps track of everything. And so uh, land prep, that's the equivalent probably. Plastic, maybe a little bit uh, more. Fumigation service, 3,000. Remember, our fumigation service was 5,000. Why is that? I asked Michael because he's using drip fumigation in rotation with flat, which subsequently cuts his cost down substantially. So going to, um, here's the pest management, $4,000. We were at $1,600 for pest management. That's a big one. And then also the spray application labor is $975. I strongly suspect, and do you remember, did he use a bug vac? Did he have a bug vac on that farm? I'm feeling a bug vac there because there's, there's, there's a big number in there somewhere. He didn't say, huh? Okay, I'll, I should have asked him, but you know, in the meeting, you're moving around so much, so I didn't have a chance. So anyway, pest, the uh, pest control costs are substantially higher, and they're, they're going to push that up quite a bit. But again, in the scheme of things, it's smart to keep your crop going and not take unnecessary risks. So, uh, and then we have uh, roll-offs and dump fees. That is cleanup, so he's about 225 higher. Okay, so just trending a little bit higher on his costs on that farm and then so that's how you end up with the total grow cost being higher than what we had but what's interesting now and when you do accounting the line items are different right so he's got so he does per tray and if you look at that the tables for per tray i forget it's like maybe page 15 16 we do per tray cost but just so i can explain it better i do it the way i did it you know going by per acre cost and so again his baseline was 7500 total harvest cost for Michael was 47,250, we're well above that. And you know why? Because our cooling cost is a lot higher. I did not include the marketing cost because he doesn't have the marketing cost. His marketing cost must be up here. 
Sometimes the coolers charge in the tray the marketing costs. I don't know, but ours is, ours is significantly higher, and that's how our costs get to be so different. Our harvesting costs are lower, but we got that cooling, and then we also have the marketing, which pushes it up substantially by $10,000. His break-even point was 1082. Ours is probably around 1150. I was around 11.50, so if you go into a ranging analysis, that's what you get. 10, 5, what I'm going to do, I'm going to, okay, I'm going to do this one because you had these, these gentlemen from Plenty, but this is another case. This was, a, this was um, some growers went to Europe and they were looking at this raised bed sterile substrate system, okay, so they told the Strawberry Commission research team to do it. And so what it is, you build up your bed, and then you push these troughs into the bed, you put weed mat on top of it, and then you can see the gentleman right there putting in a sterile substrate, like what you use in greenhouses, right? So it's kind of a hybrid greenhouse field system, seems like that might be good. And then you have all of this stuff, right? You have a different system, you have to use different fertilizers, you need to be uh, irrigating with a tremendous frequency that causes, you need some computational power, you need more supervision, and so the cost that we got out of this, again, we're applying what we learned. The cost that I was given, the cost I heard was $70,000 for your cultural input and labor. The cultural input here are very high. The weed mat gets tossed out, the sterile substrate gets tossed out, a lot of stuff is getting tossed out, so we are costing in one year rather than depreciating over time. So harvest labor uh, is the same. The yields were the same. There weren't any differences in, in yield. But look at the total cost. It's $135,000. What do you think the cost per tray is for that, 20? That's not even on our range. So when they came to me and they wanted me to work on this, I said, no, I'm a money guy. I'm sorry. That's just, it's too far. They did do it. They accomplished something. And when you look at something like vertical farming and that sort of thing, eesh, that's so much money, right? How are you going to do it? And so people, you know, I'm a little older, so people are like, hey, what's wrong with you, man? You got to, you know, get with the program. You know, things are changing. But it's just like, this is costing so much money. So I'm going to, uh, this is, very quickly, you got to give me a second. So Mexico, there's a bunch of growers now growing in Mexico. And there's, this is an article that just came out last year. Low salaries are favoring Mexican competitiveness. The money line right here, uh, that the pay for pickers in Mexico, or workers, I should say, does not exceed $10 per day. I did some cross-checking on that. It's actually around 30 in Baja, California. Still, it's about 80%, it's about 20% of what we pay here. Wow, that's, that's, a, that's a kick. So let's have a look again at my little chart. Cultural labor, uh, 13,055. Cultural inputs are the same. You're bringing everything in from the United States. Harvest labor, way, way down. And then harvest input, 30,000. So the total is $53,000. Man, that's a, okay. So I've got to make some calls. There has to be unseen cost in here. One is D cell. Another one talking with a gentleman. Uh, yesterday's all your stuff has to come in from the United States, so you got to get it over the border. And guess what? When you're shipping your fruit back to the United States to sell it, you have what's called a border. And there's been holdups. I remember there was a train of semis held up at the border. They were going to search it, who knows what. They had to put in a call to Senator Dianne Feinstein to get the darn fruit across the border. If you're setting, if you're shipping lumber or walnuts or something like that, okay, just park it. We'll, we'll take care of it. But fruit, eh. That's, you know, there's, there's unseen costs here. So it's not just a big party. And also they've had a significant labor unrest in these places too because the pay is, is a, a, on the low side. Okay. So rising cost of labor. I just, this is the last slide now. Um, we have the increase of $15 per hour and also the overtime. I don't want to make it complicated, but it's now over 40 hours. It's time and a half. It's gone up a lot. It's gone up 7% in a single year. So instead of uh, 87,000, now you're at 90,000. It, it affects the growers so much. These, these, ri these rapid rises in minimum wage, you know, I, I know they're well intended, but it's a huge hit for the grower. It's a huge hit for the grower, especially for a grower that uses so much labor. So anyway, that, that concludes my talk. Uh, thank you for your, I get, that's strawberry juice. <laughs> so, all right, thanks. <laughs> We have time for questions. Cool. I, I'll, we'll start with one and uh, go from there. What, sure. What would possess you to do a study like this? Who's asking for this? What is it used for? So, if you can't, if if you have, if you don't know by now, I'm very interested in money. 
not to be rich or anything, but it's just like, you know, money is what makes a, you know, makes a business run. That's the important part. And to peer into, because, you know, I'm, I'm a biologist by training, and it's just like, okay, this is great, you know, growing these plants, but it's, why, why is this person not succeeding? This person is really doing everything right, but their business is failing. Why is that? And so this study. The other part of this study, growers do use this. For example, I mentioned the case with the runner cutting robot. That's very useful information to them because it's, it, this is from a neutral source. And that's, that's why I'm so firm on this. I don't like people telling me what to put in because we need to protect this. this is, people trust this. If you have a private person do it, well, it's like there might be an incentive to you know, plump the numbers. This is University of California, so it stays neutral and it will always be neutral. But banks use them when extending loans. Insurance companies use them when developing policies. And you know, if someone wants to get started, I really, really, if you want to get started in Paris, you, sh you really should look at this. Well, you did now, right? But we have it for organic strawberries, we have it for raspberries, blackberries, we got it for just about everything. If you're thinking about going, so you know what you're up against. If you get in and you're halfway through the season and you just flat out ran out of money, what does that do to you? I remember meeting a guy, he, he got his field closed for light-burn apple moth. It was just May. He didn't have enough money to buy pesticide. He had a double mortgage on his house. It made me so sad. He just didn't know where he was headed. He wanted to do farming. Well, that's great. Start small because it's so expensive to do this. That's why I did it. And I, you know, I don't do this on my own. I work with a team from UC Davis. Uh, Jeremy Murdoch has, works with me very closely. Uh, I got all the grower contacts. He has the economics. They, they have the, the programs to run all of these depreciation tables and everything like that. I enjoy them. I really, I, I really feel strongly about that. Thank you. Other questions are there from, from the group? I'm just going to. Oh, Shashika, yeah. Um, I know you did one of these before. Uh, how frequently do you think it's transitioning? Yeah, see, that's the thing. It's, you know, really, they should be. In, the way things are right now, it'd be great to update them every year, but there's no way. I will tell you right now, uh, the last one we did here was 2016, and it was actually the group at Cal Poly because they're interested in this runner cutter. I'm like, well, we got to do it, so I'll, I'll prioritize this one and get it done. We're right now working on one for organic strawberries, but then after that, we're going to have to do raspberries and blackberries. It takes about eight months to do the study. And it's not, I'm not just working on this study, right? I mean, it's, there's other things going on, but we kind of pick our way through. It's hard to get a hold of growers in the middle of summer. You know, I show up with this thing, hey, can you truth test this? You got a couple hours? I mean, that's not going to work. But, you know, around between Thanksgiving and Christmas is usually pretty good. And, and you know, I tell you, it's very gracious of the growers to spend the time with me and my colleagues to go over these and provide this information. It really is. And I will tell you, when you're working with growers, the numbers they, they tell me, they disappear. I, I don't know what they are. They just go as averages. There's, never, there's nobody's numbers in here. Because people are, it's, it's your business, you know, it's very personal. Yeah? How many growers do you interview for this? It's probably like 15. And then, you know, once we get into like pesticide programs, I probably talk to PCAs a bit, you know, what do you think here? And then, you know, some things like the fertilizer program, I kind of have an idea myself because no growers are going to tell me, right? So it's, it's put together from different pieces. It's not like 15 growers give me the whole thing. It's like, okay, I need more color on this, so I'm going to talk to PCA, talk to, like, the, excuse me, the cost of fumigation, I went to TriCal, just gave them a call, and then the other two, and we kind of got an average. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm really interested in the biodegradable plastic mold. Oh, yeah. A lot of people are. Love it. What, what a good question. Thank you. Because the thing is, so we have this cost of Brexit. They will be more expensive. So initially, we, all our samples we're getting for free. A roll has like 1,000 feet on it. Um, the, the one thing that we're hoping is that the expense of the plastic can, can be offset a little bit by your roll-off fees. Your, your, your disposal fees now are zero. Well, not zero because you've got to disc it and, and all that kind of thing. The one route that I would not want to see happen would be regulation. And no one's talking about that, and I'm, I'm not going to be any part of a regulatory effort. But, you know, a lot of people, and it's, it is, especially with younger people, because it's, this is a lot of plastic that we're just releasing. It, it doesn't disappear. It stays. It gets smaller and smaller, but it's there. That people are producing plastic and just releasing it into the world without taking any responsibility after that, that, that doesn't seem to make sense. It is hard. This work, um, right now the plastic does last through the season. We have several plastic last through the season. The rub now is breaking it down. 
it doesn't break, it doesn't break down like lickety split. So we still have pieces like this big. They'll eventually go away. But you know, if you got a, like a lettuce grower after you, whose seeds are like that big, they're not going to be happy about sheets of plastic in the field. So that's it. So yeah, they'll be more expensive. We're hoping to get it offset on those roll-off fees. Yes. Yeah. So this is nice. We are getting some um, collaboration with TriCal, and they're testing the different plastics for what they, um, how much they resist the one, the exit of the fumigation the, of the fumigant itself, and then two, it, is the fumigant anyway negatively affecting the plastic and breaking it down? Because it would be nice to be able to use that for fumigation. Right now, if someone were to use biodegradable plastic over fumigation, you would basically count it. There's no plastic there because we just don't know how much it's doing. It's not going to be like TIF. It won't, it won't be that good, you know, but it, it might, you know, especially when you're doing drip uh, fumigation, it'd be nice to be able to put that on top. So there's a lot of work to be done on Really nice team. A really nice team. We have a, 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 a scientist here from Cal Poly. Yeah, Dr. Sisla. C yeah, Sisla. she's great. We have a, a, some of that mulch out in our... Oh, you do? And uh, last year, it looked as good as the day we laid it. At the end it does. Of the season. Yeah. It's the, not, not degrading very fast. He, and I always tell people, they get really impatient, like, oh, okay, you know, what, what, when can we start using it? Well, now we have to go to the next step. When we started, we didn't know how long it was going to last. Our worry was just going to break apart in the middle of the season. It does not break apart. So, yeah, we'll, we'll keep at it. Right. That's, that's why we're doing it now. We have some um, pot studies going up uh, in Washington, and then we have two field studies going on here where we have flagged it. When they don't even flag it out, we have it GPSed where that is, and we'll just see. And we, the, yeah. growers are, the growers are being really good about it because those pieces. See, the thing is, you know, again, knowing what we know about tillage, the, the veg growers, they do substantial amounts of tillage too. So where we stand right now, is the plastic was broken down with three disc passes on top, and we had pieces like about that big. That's three disc passes. I mean, veg grower goes, and they're going to be doing another 12 passes. What's left after that? I think more than anything, it's going to be the tillage that breaks that plastic down, and then the microorganisms will break it down. So it's like, a, it's like I guess it would be like a starch polymer, a lot of these, just different thicknesses and colors. It's, it's going to take a while, but we're doing it, you know? And so... That's, I was just discussing with the group earlier, it's just science sometimes takes time. People want it to happen like right away and I, we're, we're, it, it's a good group. Interesting enough, the group, it's all women and me. I remember the first time we got together for, for lunch and stuff, I'm like, wow, this is so much energy and just really, this is great. It's a, it's a good project, I really like it. I really like it, yeah. All right. Okay, thank you. Well,